there's the flag of Nicaragua, Colombia, Honduras. Colombia, it's been so long. Colombia, Dominican Republic. Write the names because I can't learn them all. Puerto Rico, Ecuador, Venezuela. Venezuela is having elections today. Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico. We're still missing Argentina, ladies and gentlemen. Look at all the Colombian flags. Venezuela, Ecuador, all the countries, all the countries. Don't stop that applause because we're receiving the world. Asia, Africa, America, Australia. Let that applause be gigantic, ladies and gentlemen. How beautiful. I'm not going to say anything about Colombia because I'm a gentleman. First of all, first, first, I'm not going to say anything. Second, Colombia. <laughs> no, 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 because last time they told me don't say anything because, because nobody cares about soccer rivalries. The only important thing is that Argentina wins. All the rest is, doesn't matter, but we're happy. Thank you to those that are connecting from other parts of the planet, other parts of the world. It's a pleasure, always a pleasure to be here. We sang, we worshipped, we celebrated. We have many friends visiting us today as well. In this case, from my country, one of them, you, you'll have to raise your hand because I can't see you from here. But one is Leonardo Beoflota. He's the one that carries out all the missions in Argentina, along with Carly Anaconda, who also does it. But every time we take food to Argentina, there at, at the bottom of the country. Where are you, Leo? There you are, my beloved. God bless you. Welcome. Juan Pibre as well with him. Where's... Fernando Fereschi, there he is, my beloved Fernando, God bless you. That's my friend Fernando, we're working together as well, it's been a long time. There are many people, Pablo as well, you're all friends, and you ask, why do you name them? Well, because they're friends. When you have your own church, you'll name your own friends. No, 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 just kidding. We always welcome anyone, no matter where they come from, but obviously we can't recognize everyone by name, but welcome to those that connect from other parts of the world as well. May this be your home. May this be your safe place. And we're ready for God to speak to us today. Are we ready, people? Yes or no? Very well. There's a phrase that I tend to repeat frequently, and it's that we have to learn to see God, to see Jesus with new eyes. When I refer to new eyes, I'm talking about removing the religious filters or the belief systems that we inherited or those biases that sometimes make us see God through preconceptions. There are many people that come here, in fact, with preconceptions, saying, surely this will be like that other congregation that I knew or the ones that I see on TV. Surely they're going to talk about money, etc. There are many preconceptions or prejudices that are filters, biases, that don't allow us to see what we should truly be seeing. And if you don't uninstall these traditions, it's going to collapse everything that we believe, everything that we think, because it's a filter. That's why you have to see not just God, but the Bible. You have to read the Bible with new eyes. I've heard many speakers share the Bible as if their stories were impolute, perfectly clean, full of victory. But this book always deals with real people, with real problems that experimented real traumas, and they're written here in a raw way. These are stories of failure, there are stories of violence in here, there are stories of uncontrolled sex, polygamy, drunkenness, assassinations, incest. There are many things that we sometimes don't want to mention because we tend to think, out of prejudice I insist, that by mentioning them, we're validating them. And I'm not devaluing the Bible. On the contrary, I'm giving it more credit because if we look at all the stories without the cleanliness or the religious hygiene that we sometimes add, we realize how real these stories are. These stories are here. All these stories, because they're also your stories, my stories. Many of us are tired of hearing about the Bible in a disinfected way, all the things that we can't explain or 
that people make this book a, a motivational manual with nice phrases that have to be repeated. And we think that, that this works like the fortune cookies at Panda Express. Let's see what, uh, let's see how lucky I am today. Or as if it were a divine horoscope. But the Bible is written with raw stories, real stories. And the sterilized life stories with no pollution only belong in made up religious books to control people. And that can work very well for the Quran, for the Book of the Mormon, but not for Christianity. And I want to tell you one of those raw stories out of the many that we can find here, just as it appears in Scripture without adding or removing to the Chronicle that appears. One morning, it could have been one of the many mornings of the routine in the palace of Jerusalem. A little boy, a young boy, wakes up in his royal crib because he's the prince. He has his royal diapers changed. He's given his royal pacifier with his royal milk. <laughs> The first time that this boy in the story appears, he's presumed to be about five years old, son of the prince and grandson of the king. He has all the privileges that a little prince can have that no simple courtier would imagine, but he is the king or the future king. But this morning, the chronicle says that something interrupts the royal breakfast of our future king, a tragedy, a misfortune, an unexpected turn of events. Suddenly, the palace turns to chaos. Apparently, a messenger comes by with some bad news. And then the unforce unforeseen happens. They're shouting in the palace, people running around, commotion. These are unfamiliar sounds that the five-year-old boy can't comprehend. He doesn't understand what's going on. The bad news spreads like fireworks throughout the halls of the palace and the news is that the king and the prince have died in battle both at the same time in other words King Saul and his son Jonathan have fallen on the battlefield the boy doesn't know the meaning of the news or at least he doesn't perceive that his future is about to change in the next minutes Obviously, he's unaware, and it's fine because he's five years old. He's unaware of what pol is happening politically or what could happen in this case if his grandfather the king and his father the prince die on the same day. Because you don't even comment these types of things until, of course, it happens one day like in this story. The boy doesn't know that if the monarch and his immediate heir die on the same day, then someone else will come after the crown and after the throne. And obviously they will attempt to murder the child who is the natural heir. But I insist, since the infant ignores that his life is in danger, it's not surprising that in the midst of the chaos, he continues playing with his Nintendo rules and royal Playstations. But his nurse, his nanny, his keeper, does understand a bit of political conspiracies, or at least somebody shares it with her. And she considers that an innocent child shouldn't die over these pathetic interests in the monarchy. And the nurse knows... His babysitter knows that somebody will want to get rid of the small natural heir. So she takes him into his arms, into her arms, and she runs into the forest, knowing that there's not even time to pack the basic necessities. She has to run with the child to save his life, but something much worse will happen this morning. In the adrenaline rush of escaping with the young boy to save his life, the nurse runs into the forest and doesn't realize or doesn't see a, a, a rock or a branch that is crossing the path, almost at ground level. And so the woman falls face first, she stumbles over, and the little boy rolls on the ground. And you can hear a dry crack that leaves the woman stupefied. And the boy doesn't stop crying violently. The fall fractured both of the boy's ankles. 
And so in, a, in an attempt to continue, she lifts up the boy and she realizes that the boy's two ankles are now hanging flaccid and flimsily. But there's no turning back. She knows that the only thing to do is to continue running to save this young boy's life. I told you that this wasn't a fair story. The same day that the boy was left an orphan, without a grandfather, without a father, is the same day he abandons the palace and so the person that was carrying him in their arms drops him and he becomes a cripple for the rest of his life. And it all happened with a crack on the road, an involuntary drop of someone that was trying to save his life. And through the years, story tells us that other young boys his age grew up just like him, except they had girlfriends, they graduated, but he could only imagine it because somebody dropped him, somebody let him fall. His social life is completely damaged. He could have been a king, he could have been the natural heir to the throne. With just a snap of a fingers, he could have had an army at his disposition. But now he's just the Prince of Oblivion, his name is Mephibosheth. He has his ankles broken, but more than anything, his spirit is broken. And like someone has said, there are no prosthetics for a broken soul. And this is the first point that I want to arrive at this morning, because the majority of us that are adults, we live a moment in our childhood where somebody let us fall, all of us. This isn't to bring up anyone's trauma or for us to kill ourselves in mass, but we all have to recognize that at one point or another, somebody let us fall. In fact, men that relate with women have to be aware that they're dealing with the results and influences of that woman's experiences in her childhood. She conserves a little girl inside of her. The same thing goes for women that live with an adult man. They should also be aware that they're in continual contact with that boy that that man once was. It's not the same thing as marrying someone that's immature. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about the fact that all men hide a, a boy behind traumas, biases, beliefs. So you can't confuse the glamorous sound of high heels and makeup, designer suits that gentlemen wear. No, you have to learn to hear the sound of those little feet, those feet formed by adversity, by hidden secrets. A spouse can get to know their partner that's by their side only if they can help them heal at one point or another those, those wounds from childhood. You don't have to be a psychologist or a therapist for that. You just need common sense. We all have that pain of that crack that cosmetics can't hide. It's that broken little boy that always has that adult captive, that adult that's now very quiet. My mother and I, her children, we always complained about my father's prolonged silence. He was worse than Homer Simpson. He never spoke. So my father's communications were, eh, eh, At most, through inhumane efforts, he would say, ask your mother. That's all he would say. And my mom would say, how can you be so quiet? But then, our grandmother, his mother, the German, came to live at home with us for some time, and she told us about the childhood that my father had gone through, him and his other brothers. And there, we understood that it was a miracle that my father was still breathing. <laughs> it was a miracle that he would go on to have a family, and then we understood his silence. Behind that rough, hostile, irate man, what we found was a scared little boy. And through the years, I've learned that God is the only one that has the ability to erase what sex, what wine or money can't make disappear. God is the only mender of broken ankles, broken wrists. He is the one that heals the trauma in that quiet man that simulates rudeness. I know many of you must know someone like this if, if we don't have someone like that here today. God is the only only one that can heal that woman that has that empty gaze that not even the best eyeliner can hide. And Jesus said that he came 
to heal those that were broken in the in their hearts. And in Greek, the word, the term for broken, means shattered, literally shattered. That's what happens when you push a glass jar or a glass cup off the kitchen counter, that glass cup will broke into so many pieces that it'll be impossible to recover. It's better to throw it out. The second word in Greek is cardia. When he said, I came to heal though brokenhearted, he used the word cardia, which means heart, which is where we get the word cardiac, cardiology from. Jesus was saying that he can make our heart or he can do for our hearts what would be impossible for anyone else and some some of us that were dropped at one point or another maybe we didn't break our, our ankles but our heart was shattered into pieces in one way or another it's possible that we all have a sad story to tell if I were to ask who has a sad story we would stay here to live because we all have a sad story to tell but without a doubt the most painful thing is that the people that we trusted in the most, these are the people that on certain occasions dropped us on the ground. They let us fall because it's your dad that tells you that you're beautiful. The first compliment you'll receive from the opposite sex is your father, your first boyfriend, the one that'll say, you're so beautiful. Even if you're ugly, your dad will tell you you're beautiful. Fathers always lie. Your dad will tell you, you're a champion, little boy, even if you're a loser. Your dad, or, your, your dad is the one that carries you on his shoulders, the one that fights against the monsters under the bed, the one that tells you you're worth a lot, the one that tells you, little girl, don't agree to the first boy that wants to take you to bed. But one day, that dad abandons you when you need him the most, or a close cousin, or an uncle, or a neighbor. A close family friend takes away the most precious thing that you had, which was your innocence. Or maybe something even more complex that you wouldn't even dare share with your friends because you don't talk about those things. These are things that you can't really explain or you can't articulate. But maybe on your wedding night, you felt violated by your own husband. That's why I say it's impossible to share because they'll say, people will say, but he's your husband. But maybe that first night you didn't feel loved or valued. And it was like a crack, a silent, intimate crack. And so for the rest of your life as a couple, you decided to have sex without a soul, without having to connect ever again. You just gave up your body, but you closed off your heart. Crack. That's the sound, the common denominator in all these cases. Someone suddenly lets us fall, they drop us, and they leave us crippled in our hearts, paralyzed in our soul. And on certain occasions, maybe they were just angry words that were used often in our generations. Our parents, when they were angry, they would say anything. But those words were enough to yank us out of the palace and to leave us in the forest. And they marked us because you see your parents as great heroes, and then one day, in a moment of great anger, they tell you that you're an idiot, that you're stupid, that you're foolish, and you believe it. You assimilate these words, and they're left in your mental engram forever. I've shared on various occasions that when I was five years old, my dad said, he was completely drunk, he was, he was drunk. I wasn't drunk. I wasn't drunk at five. My father was drunk. He was completely drunk, and at one point, in fact, he even wanted to take his life. He yelled at me and said that I was at fault for my mother's cancer and I was the reason she was dying because her pregnancy with me, those pregnancies where you ask, did you want to have me? And they say, no, you were a tumor. You were just a scare. Well, that's scare. You're looking at him today in person, but that scare coincided with my mother's cancer. And so the doctors back in those days would say, it's very likely that this pregnancy accelerated the cancer. So my dad, in, in a moment of drunkenness, he blamed me. He said, it's your fault your mother's dying. And I could never forget that, that gaze, that look of hate. And so I reasoned, there must be something wrong with me because my dad loves me. And so if he says that there's something wrong with me, there must be. 
so I never allowed anyone to get close enough to see what my father had seen in me. I still wasn't aware that in the following years, I would have serious problems with speaking. But I remember it all as if it were today. Everything got worse after that day. And after the age of five, I was a sad boy. I was withdrawn, incapable of reading emotions. I couldn't read or express emotions. And during much of my childhood, I could have sworn that I didn't have a future, that I wasn't intelligent, that I hadn't been born with any gifts. So they told me throughout my childhood, you're timid, antisocial, and... The teachers back in those days, when they would diagnose children without even having any academic basis for it, even a teacher sentenced that I had slight autism and recommended therapy. But if my dad didn't even take the dog to the vet, you think he was going to take me to, to, the, to therapy? He wouldn't even take us to get our vaccines. Dad, can you take me to go get vaccines? He would say, for what? You have to die of something. So I was that little boy with sad deep eyes, melancholy. I wasn't able to find a single picture of myself in my childhood with a smile on my face. And my teachers would say, oh, he's introverted or, or he's depressed. Oh, he's just a sad boy. You gave birth to a sad boy. And my next years weren't better than that day. And the following story, though in, per, in with a different perspective, it seems petty or childish. I've written it in certain books, but I feel that it continued to mark my life. I, I share the story because I feel that it's part of what you have to live through. For some reason, my, ch my parents didn't send me to kindergarten. I assume that it was because of my mother's illness, so my debut in school was at the age of five. In first grade, I didn't go to kindergarten. Children have to go to kindergarten through preschool to get used to school, to learn how to go to the restroom, to be able to get along with the other kids. But one day in March of 1973, my mother was dying of cancer. At home, my dad was always absent or drunk, which is the same. And my brother, Diego, who was 11, was taking me to school. My first day of school, my first fateful day of school, four hours in the classroom with 20 other unknown children. So I, didn't, I, I wasn't used to going into a school and being there for an hour, then two hours. No, four hours straight away. And it never occurred to me that I could ask to go to the restroom because nobody taught me. And so I was dying of embarrassment. And so I peed my pants in the seat that I was that I was in. My corduroy corduroy pants were completely soaked. My arms were covering my face, and I stayed there sitting for as long as I could. Fortunately, the teacher didn't realize the incident had happened. Maybe she didn't see it. She's dead already, so I can't ask her. But she said out loud, "Come on, little boy, you have to go out to go home. School's over." It was 5 p.m. already, and I went outside with other children laughing at me, and my 11-year-old brother was waiting for me with his other 11-year-old friends at the exit, and then what happened next is what I remember most. Because we lived four blocks away from the school, and my brother, who was embarrassed because of my soaked pants, he made me walk a few steps ahead of him and his friends, and behind me I could hear the laughter of the children who were observing me and making jokes. And so I walked looking at the ground. I didn't want to turn around. I was walking in silence, and I didn't want to be with people anymore. I never wanted to go into public again. I told my mom, I went to school already. I don't want to go back. And she said, no, you have to continue your whole life. And so I decided to never speak in public again. And so that continued marking me. My mother continued battling against cancer for about another two years, and I remained very quiet for much of my childhood. I spent time drawing. I read books voraciously. I know that my parents didn't explicitly, explicitly, I, don't, I knew that they weren't explicitly at fault, but I knew, I know that my mom with her cancer, my dad with his drunkenness, and my, my brother with his jokes and laughing, they let me fall. 
But everything that was failed in me, God turned it around so that he can capitalize it all and turn me into the man I am today. But that was one of my cracks. It doesn't necessarily have to be sexual abuse or a trauma of being left as an orphan. Sometimes there are small details that when we dig and excavate archaeologically, we find them in our past, and they determine how we see life as an adult. The second point in this story is that maybe this young prince, maybe he was never able to comprehend the motivations of the nurse, that the nurse was trying to save his life. I think that the little boy, the kid, as he grew up, I'm sure that he cursed the nurse on more than one occasion, or maybe he did it frequently. Something like, you should have been more careful. How can an adult woman be so stupid to stumble over a branch? What do you mean you didn't see it? Why weren't you just holding my hand? I was five years old. I could have ran with you. Who dares carry a five-year-old? I think he probably cursed her more than once. The young boy might have been a very upset prince. I don't know if you've ever seen someone's eyes ablaze, someone that went to hell and was burned by their own story. Most likely when somebody suffers a lot, they hide their pain, shielding themselves with, with anger. When I see somebody that's angry, either they're a mother-in-law or, or they had a bad childhood or a bad life because sometimes, all jokes aside, anger is the only protection that you can get on your own. If I, don't, if I get angry, they'll never do what they did to me again. There are some people that are just scared cats trying to act like lions in hopes that nobody will find out that beneath their roar there are no teeth, just tears. When somebody's very upset, generally speaking, it's somebody that has gone through a lot of pain. Then there are those of us that, that get mad from time to time, but there are others that are mad all the time. You, t you say, hey, good morning, and they say, <laughs> <laughs> it seems like a woman probably recognized that bark, huh? There is a, a great British writer named Florence Smith that attributed a, a great portion of her writings to her difficult childhood. And one of her most famous poems is from 1957, and it's titled, I'm not waving, hello, I'm drowning. I'm not greeting you, I'm drowning. And she spoke of a woman drowning in the sea and she can't get the help from anyone that's washing from the shore. They see her, but they assume that she's just greeting them. So they continue on their way, possibly even waving back, allowing her to drown. I'm not waving, I'm drowning, the poem says. And even though sometimes people don't notice, we're also saying the same thing. We say, I'm not greeting, I'm not waving, I'm drowning. We try to ask for help, but sometimes people don't see us. And when we're children, we don't even know how to ask for help. I always say that old wounds have a very good memory, but abysmally poor interpretative skills. Because when you're a child, you interpret things differently. We call it a memory of the memory. It's true that pain keeps memories fresh, but pain in the brain also has a resource. God formed it in a way to where it'll try and shield, cover, or edit what truly happened. And on certain occasions, that's good because you don't remember the entire trauma, but sometimes we reach the wrong conclusions. And so we always look for a nurse to blame for what happened to us. And I've learned with life that in the game of, of fault, nobody ever wins. That's like the casino. The house always wins. Those that blame others for their own emo emotions spend their whole lives making others responsible for their destiny. They say, no, I did bad in life because my parents didn't raise me right or because I was born in poverty. Others say, no, 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 I'm in debt, but because of this government, with the previous government, you were also in debt. Yeah, yeah, but a little bit less. Others say, no, 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 I don't go to church. I don't get close to God because uh, a, preach, a, 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 a priest or a pastor, they hurt me. And so after that, I, I vaccinated myself against God. 
I read a book recently named no, called The Anatomy of, of Stupidity. I recommend it. Don't give it to a friend because they're going to think it's an indirect. <laughs> but I liked it because it said that stupidity isn't uh, a defect. It's not an insult because it's not a congenital defect. You can't say, oh, my dad was stupid, my grandfather was stupid, so I inherited it. No, it's a learned condition. You have to learn. You go through a course of stupidity. And part of that learned stupidity is victimizing. That's stupidity learned by excellence when you make yourself the victim and you say well it's what I was dealt it was the nurse's fault that I am the way I am when you live your life blaming others the only thing that we're going we're going to accomplish is anger and the third point in this story is how someone might have lived this trauma someone that was Included in this story as as just a supporting role, the nurse. Yo, we always think about the boy who was left a cripple, but what about the nurse? The guilt that she must have felt that she had to deal with for years, right? How many times do you think she dreamt of that escape from the palace once and again? On how many occasions do you think she recounted that tragic morning, thinking if she would have left sooner, if she would have left later, if she would have taken another uh, path, if she would have looked down and noticed the branch? The young boy would be fine. He wouldn't be a prince because he had to be exiled, but he would have use of extremities. He, she probably thought, why did I drop him? Because the young boy blames her all the time. I've heard of many people that battle against a distorted image of something that happened in the past. And they are left self-obsessed over what happened. There are people that say, I heard during counseling once that a woman said, my mother used to say that I am toxic. And she's right. I damage everything that I touch, all the relationships that I'm in. Other women have said, my first husband was an abuser, and now my current husband abuses me as well. So I think I attract these men. Maybe I deserve it. Another woman says, I can't have children, so it must be a punishment of something that I did in the past. The point is the same. What's wrong inside of me? And the opposite of those that blame others, you can also find people that blame themselves. If I were a modern preacher, I would tell you, tell the person next to you, don't blame yourself. But I know that there are many people that feel blame over everything. And when that happens, what do we do? Well, we look to relate or get closer to people that make us feel more and more blame, more fault, and that attracts us. And that has to do with the natural attraction. If you were brought up in a home where everything was chaos, you know there are homes where everything's crazy, shouting, Pass me the salt! What? So, chaos for you is normal. If shouting and tantrums filled your mind when you were young, then chaos is your soundtrack for your adult life. You have to continue shouting. There are people that worship God shouting, Lord! Because they think that, that, the, that God has a problem with hearing like their husband does. So they shout. Shouting is your soundtrack. If your family was cold and not very expressive, then you tend to drag that treatment on with your spouse. You say, oh, well, my dad was cold. He wouldn't even say good morning. Well, then why do you have to repeat the pattern? Well, because that's how my dad was. And your grandpa? Even worse. If your sexual purity was violated or altered when you were a little boy or little girl, well, then maybe sex is the first thing that you offer in a relationship because that's what was expected of you or because you believe that in offering that, that's where your value resides and that's where your personality is validated. Really, the opposite should happen, but when we haven't resolved certain problems, our lives always gravitate around the bad things that we know. And since we always desire to close cycles, God created us to close out seasons without 
believing it or knowing it, we're attracted to the same thing that we never resolved to see if we can close that cycle. I know women that were brought up by violent fathers and when they got married, they chose a man that looked just like their father and you feel like saying, really? Because by not resolving it, they chose what they already knew. There are people that choose what they assume to be normal in a relationship. There are women that like to be not subjected, but slapped across the face when they raise their voice. And you ask why? Well, that's their normal. They don't know what a healthy relationship looks like, and they don't know that they're in a cycle that they cannot escape. And I ask myself, if the nurse repeated that pattern of guilt, and I think that, yes, she might have. She must have concluded that the same way she ruined the young prince's life, she must have said, the only thing they asked me to do was to take care of the king's grandson, and I couldn't even do that. So I'm sure that whoever I'm around, I'll definitely ruin their lives. That's why I don't believe that that woman ever got married. I don't think she ever wanted a serious relationship because she must have thought, whoever I'm around, I ruined their lives. If I ruined a five-year-old boy's life, what can I expect in my adult life? And the fourth point in the story is that we have to be aware this morning that maybe on top of letting us fall, Maybe we've let somebody fall. I know, for example, that divorce is the end of a common dream. And when something collapses, the glass scatters all over. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if your dreams didn't come true, then your children's dreams can't happen. While you're in the process of picking up all the glass shards, you have to be careful to not involve your children. I know it sounds like something childish and everybody would say, no, 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 I could never. But the word pervert, according to the official dictionary, it means to deviate something from its natural use. Perversion isn't just sexual. When we deviate, the natural use of a child, we're perverting them. And many parents caused us stress by perverting us with adult problems that we couldn't process because we were too small. Many separated or divorced parents take their children as hostages or, or want to make them accomplices to bring them on their side of the, of the divide. But they have to understand that there's two agendas. One is their marriage and one is the family. Maybe their, their marriage was damaged but that family relationship can't be damaged. I know it's difficult because although your partner has failed you as a, uh, as in, in your marriage, you still have to honor them as the mother or father of your children because when you poison them, no matter how upset you are, I'm not minimizing how upset you can get, when we poison a child in respect to their mother or father, we're not punishing our partner. We're letting our child fall. We're letting them roll on the ground, breaking their, their ankles, repeating the same stories that we went through. So maybe you weren't able to solve your relationship, but save your kids. They never asked to become victims of a war that they didn't declare. They're the prophecy, and they deserve to not be dropped. They deserve for God to fulfill the purpose in their lives, and even when they're adults, they don't deserve to roll on the ground. Well, the story of our exiled prince tells us that he had to spend the rest of his life in captivity in a place called Lo Debar, a place where dreams die and where kings, obviously, in this case, become beggars. This is the place where wounds are hidden where the cripples run away to. Long ago, I shared a message called Underneath the Rose. It comes from a Latin phrase called Sabrosa, Sabrose. It's a term that has a connotation of secrecy and, and, and confidentiality. The Greeks and the Romans began to use the rose as a symbol of silence and the secret meetings of masonry or the Templars were literally carried out underneath a rose painted on the ceiling of the room they were in. So when you would enter a, a room and there was a rose on the ceiling, it was a reminder to all those invited that they should be discreet. So 
but there was no gossip. Maybe I should paint a giant rose in here, in River. here at River. But the Templars would say, whatever is said or done under the rose stays under the rose. But the worst part, and this we shouldn't laugh at this, but in the medieval times, the feudal lords that were pedophiles would place a rose on the doors, right above the doors of their bedrooms, which meant even if the guards heard shouting from children, from little boys to little girls, they shouldn't intervene because they were acting under the rose. So under the rose also means to hide that frightening act. Pain, to hide pain. To hide it under something that's apparently beautiful, like makeup, like clothing, but beneath it all, there's fear and pain. Well, Lodabar represents that place under the rose where sometimes we're obligated to, to staying quiet. Or what's worse, faking it, not sharing it. My mother would always say, don't make it bigger than it has to be. Yeah, mom, but this happened. And instead of defending me, she would say, no, 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 just don't, don't make it bigger. That's a way of making us fall. It surprises me that with certain congregations, they still insist with the idea that modest clothing is synonymous. It's, it's a sign of holiness, of purity. So if a patient is dressed in a suit, then they're fine. It doesn't matter that they have hemorrhaging underneath it all. There are churches, basilicas, synagogues filled with people dressed on the outside but hurt on the inside. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what it means to deal with the symptoms instead of going to the origin of the pain. So you can't hide the pain by painting a rose on the ceiling and that's it. We're safe. We're saved and that's it. No, it's not just confess that there's victory. It's not just about confessing. In fact, wounds and scars have a special beauty. When they are healed, you don't hide them. Scars tell our life story, yes or no? Those that don't have any scars, it's because they never fought any battles. I tend to distrust of those that don't have any scars, those that have Botox and look like this. Even worse so, because they don't even have wrinkles, they haven't lived. They're like a ninja turtle. The wounds in life are like a plaque of honor, yes or no? Wounds show everyone that we don't turn away, that we don't give up. We were given a good beating, but we didn't leave. We didn't get out of the ring. Yes or no? At 15, I had an accident in the carpentry. At the age of 15, I went to go work with my father at the carpentry, and I cut off two fingers from my right hand. And for a long time, I hid this hand so my scars wouldn't be seen, especially if I was giving an interview. I would try and hide my hand. But through time, I realized that those marks make my hand unique. It has a history that yours does not. <laughs> and fundamentally, it has a certain beauty that makes it special. Like someone said, wounds heal, but never be ashamed of the scar. Remember that Jesus chose to carry them, to bear them, and he wasn't ashamed of having them on his hands because they remind him of your life, my life. Yes or no? But as it tends to happen in these stories, suddenly there's an unexpected turn of events. The story of our Prince of, of Oblivion. A few years go by, we would assume that maybe 20, 25 years later, and King David, the new king, who was now occupying Saul's throne, the grandfather of the forgotten prince, one day wakes up a little worried. Most likely, the previous night, he had a reoccurring nightmare, or maybe... It was just a certain hunch that he felt. And so David calls his assistants, and it occurs to him to ask if, in fact, any descendant of the old king might be alive. He says something like, you know, I can't sleep, and I woke up thinking about my friend Jonathan, Prince Jonathan. I never knew if he had a child, if that child exists anywhere. Maybe a prince survives. Someone that has to do with that lineage, I owe it to my friend. Even though he's deceased, I owe it to him. And at that time, there was Ziba, a certain assistant, that in one way or another was the bridge between two governments because he had served the extinct King Saul, and now he was serving King David. And he says, yes, David, 
There is one son. He's Jonathan's son, but you know, he lives in exile, hidden in a place called Lodabar. That's where beggars tend to go, people that are living on the streets. And David can't believe what he's hearing. He doesn't believe it. And so he gives the order immediately. He says, well, what are you waiting for? Go and get him. Tell him that I want him to come to the palace now. He's my friend's son. He's a prince. Even if he is not the natural heir to the crown. Basiba clarifies and says, well, there is a small problem, your majesty. The man is crippled. No matter how much we call him, he won't come on his own. We can give an official communication. But he can't come. And I think today, this very morning, there are many people like this. Or afternoon, evening, night, wherever you're watching me from. There are many people in this condition. There are people that know they have a second opportunity. And they've heard the edict from the king. But they're far too broken to return. I've dealt with many people like this in the last years. People that have said, I want to do things right, but, you know, I just I can't. Life hit them too hard, and now they can't walk on their own. They can't get close to God on their own. They know what they have to do. They know that what they're doing now is incorrect, but they can't get up. They have every intention, but that intention remains between the origin and destiny, like Mephibosheth, like this young boy. I know that in his mind he wanted to walk, but his legs didn't listen, and so the intention remains in its origin, and he stays where he is. And so when David hears about this, he resolves it pragmatically. He tells Ziba to go all the way to Lodabar, take a caravan from the court, and to bring him, to carry him back to the palace. That day also comes for all those that are disabled in their souls. The day that somebody comes to look for you. In this case, a royal committee arrives in Lodabar. And I love this special effect because I'm going to put it in almost every message. <laughs> all of Lodabar burst into commotion. It's not the same trumpet as Mr. Cohen. It's another one. We don't have, we don't have the budget for diverse effects and so the messenger of the king reads from a scroll the royal edict proclaims that you return to your condition as prince the king has asked you to join him at his table with the rest of his princes his children on this day it is edict and law and one that was taken away from the palace being a child now returns carried to the palace now as an adult he returns to the silence of the palace of course bringing a beggar back to the palace is a risk to sit an heir someone that was a refugee for his entire life that's not something that everyone's going to understand that's a risk there's a phrase that always fascinated me and it's the phrase a calculated risk it was it was made up during the second world war it was part of the military jargon when they would plan a mission and, and decide how many soldiers they might lose and so that term calculated risk became popular it became popular in in commerce and human resources before anyone is hired they calculate the risk if the potential value of obtaining them goes beyond the cost to hire them and if the value is greater then they'll, they'll take on the risk your wife says mom wants to come over you have to calculate the risk should I deal with my mother-in-law or have problems with my wife? Well, that's a calculated risk. It's all fine, but what happens when Christianity becomes a matter of calculated risks? What happens if our churches are constantly calculating the risks of what will people say? What happens when Christ's followers, when we become afraid of risks. We don't want to run risks, and so we just stay in our comfort zones. What happens when we see people 
that are not waving at us from the sea. They're drowning, but we don't want to wave back, or we don't want to sa save them. You say, I don't want to get wet. And when you spend enough time seated at the king's table, it's very likely that our memory will become fragile. And you almost feel entitled to be at that royal table, and we forget that one day we were also broken. But all the other cripples are not just unbelievers. Worldly people know their souls in need of God's love, and sometimes we forget that we also need mercy. We can't just we can't give what we don't need. So we have to go out and look for those that are far too broken to be able to come. Not everyone will come to church next Sunday and wait in line at 6 a.m. No, sometimes we have to wake up and help someone else survive. Sometimes we have to tell someone, hey, let's go to church and then I'll invite you to lunch. Even though it'll cost you something, that's a calculated risk. But we have to help others get through what we've been through already. God helps us recover from all of our wounds and scars, but not to put us in a museum, but so that we can help others that are going through that same pain, so that we understand those that are going through the same situation. And so our purpose is found where our misery once was. Our purpose isn't to sit at the king's table. Oh, now I come every Sunday and I spend two hours here. No! Our purpose is not to sit at the table and debate about the napkins, the, the glasses, the silverware. No, our purpose is in Lodabar, that same place where we cried. That is the place that will bring healing to those that are going through that same pain. Am I clear or not? That's the place we should go back to, to help them escape their confinement. Romans 9.23 says, He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy. We're merciful because we've received mercy. Is there someone here that doesn't need God's forgiveness? Is there anyone that says, no, 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 for me, Jesus died in vain because I was already holy. Is there anyone like this? Not even us Argentinians are like this. Look at that. Look. Those that were once exiled have a compassion that can only come from being exiled at one point. Our misery has roots in the memory of our own tragedies. If we ever get through a storm, we have a very different attitude to those that have never been through a storm. A woman that survives cancer will understand other women that are going through the same thing. Someone that has gone through a, a divorce is not going to judge that marriage that is in a crisis. And I want to tell you something else which is the most astonishing part. The Bible narrates that Mephibosheth arrives to the palace being carried. He uses his crutches how he can, and he stands before the king. And the king says, do not fear. Don't be afraid. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. And I also loved your grandfather. So I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you will eat here with me at the king's table. I won't give you a servant's table. You're going to eat with my princes, with my children. Then he called Ziba, the servant that went to go find him. And he said, Everything that belonged to Saul and his family, give it to him. I don't know who lives there. Kick out whoever you have to kick out, but return all the land to him. Those lands were filled with Hispanics, of course. Argentinians, Salvadorians, Mexicans saying, hey, what's going on? But they had to be displaced. And he tells him, <laughs> he tells Ziba, you're going to produce food for him so that he never lacks food. But when it's lunchtime or dinner time, he eats here with my children. David brought restitution to everything that he had lost. All the years that he couldn't have in the palace, he brought restitution. Tell me if that's not God. That's our king. But here is what astonished me the most. Mephibosheth ended his days being a crippled. He was never put through an operation or a surgery. We never hear about a miraculous healing. He continued depending on the crutches to get from one place to another. So that's how he, how he continued until his old age. So when you imagine this story, you can commit the mistake 
of thinking that he was a beggar seated at the table like someone that brings in a homeless person during the holidays. There are those that say, you know, it was Christmas and, an, and a homeless person asked for food and we invited him into our home. He barely washed his hands and sat at the table. We might think that it's a beggar seated at the king's table, just a cripple, but we're missing a detail. Mephibosheth's innocence, even though he spent a large part of his life in a cave, he was a prince. He never stopped being the son of the prince and the grandchild, the grandson of the king. I want you to remember this. It doesn't matter how long you've been away from God, your royal condition has never changed. Never. Never. Now, maybe you smell bad maybe you stink but you have the soul of a prince you have king's blood and this isn't an excuse to not shower you can't say hey what's going on I have the king the uh, I have king's blood no, no no you have to shower so don't imagine a table where the king is sitting with all his children all the princes and then an intruder a beggar that's there no 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 in fact, it is said that a photographer from the magazine Faces of Jerusalem was present on that day. And he took the photograph of the first lunch when Mephibosheth sat with the king. Obviously, we're River Arena and we have contacts. I was able to call Bukele. I don't know what Bukele has to do with Jerusalem, but <coughs> he is the only president that I have access to for now, so and we were able to access that almost secret family picture, which is here. So I'm going to describe to you the diners, David's children, starting from your right to left. You follow me? From your right to left. Every, everyone remembers which one is your right hand, right? Perfect. The one on the end, on the right hand side, the one wearing the orange turban is the firstborn, Amnon. The second next to him with a thick black beard is Daniel. Another one of David's children. The third one with his head inclined is Solomon. He's the one that will inherit the throne. The fourth one, from right to left, with the red turban, is Adonijah. And then we get to the one with the crown, King David. The second one after the king, or the next one after the king, is Absalom. The one with the longest hair. It's just that he has to pick it up for dinner. Then next to him, the beautiful Tamar, of course. Almost behind her, we find Shephatiah. The two on the end, on the left, the last two are Shamua. We have Shamua and Elishama. And the third one, counting from your left, the one that looks the most handsome, almost Argentinian, show me the third one from the left, please, director. That is Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is the one that has turbante. Mephibosheth is the one not wearing a turban. He's the one that looks like he's in a soap opera at 6, 7 central. They say he was the first Argentinian in history. <laughs> As you might see, there is no difference between him or the other princes or any of the other children. It happens almost in secret, but I'm sure that this detail, nobody saw this detail. This is the most important detail in the whole picture. I dare say that this detail, what I'm about to mention, is the main part. What unites them all? What makes them all the same? 
No, no, no los turbantes. No, 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 not the turbans. No, Mephibosheth el mantel, doesn't have it. El mantel tapa las piernas de quien está lisiado. El mantel the cloth on the table, no it caminar. covers all their feet. Este it covers revista, everyone's condition. It doesn't show the one that can't dijo, walk. Oh, oh, hay un en la mesa. No one said after el seeing this picture, oh, there's a cripple. No, that cloth is God's grace, príncipes. which covers up eh, our wounds and makes us look like <laughs> princes. It's marvelous, <laughs> people, isn't it? Someone eso. has to celebrate more than that. Ahora, now, ser un hijo, o ser una to be a child, a son or daughter of God, has nothing to do with being worthy. Nobody is worthy. That's where the phrase comes from, that I'm too wicked to go to church. Well, those of us that are here are not better than the rest. To be a prince or a princess or an heir to the throne has nothing to do with how long we've lived in the palace. Ephesians 2.8 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good we have done so that none of us can boast about it. We can't say, oh, well, I've done a lot of nice things for God. That's why I'm saved or I've donated a lot. No. I confess to you that the scars on my right hand aren't the only scars that I have. These are the ones that you can see, the physical ones. In fact, the ones that I can't hide. But I have scars that are much uglier in my soul and marks in my heart that you could never, ever imagine. The story of when I peed my pants isn't my worst story. It's the one that I can share. I have many areas in my life that are mutilated, that are crippled, but you'll never see them, and it's not a matter of hypocrisy. It's the same way I, nor anyone else, will ever be able to see your marks. And it's not because we don't have them or because we pretend, but because the cloth at the table of the king hides them. And he called us in, he called us to his table, and the cloth of his grace hides everything that we don't want to be seen. Huh? And it makes us look like princes and princesses. And though many of us don't want to share that we were... Though many of us would like to say that we were able to walk without crutches, many of us still depend on them. Many of the traumas that I experience still accompany me. We can't say that our wounds disappeared because we still have them, but we can celebrate that we all look good behind that tablecloth. I see all of you as princes and princesses, so I'm going to say goodbye to the people that are watching via live stream. Here we're going to sing, the king has called you in. And to all the princesses and princesses around the world. These are the stories that you don't have to add much to. These are the ones that you should meditate on, thinking about the most marvelous thing that has happened to us. The cloth makes us different. We can't be petulant. When you remember that there was, there's a time where the lunch ends, there's a time where Absalom says, Dad, I'm going to work. Solomon says, I'm going to continue, I don't know, writing poems. Pros. Someone else gets up, Amnon says, I'm going to continue practicing with my sword, but there's only one that stays after everyone leaves, after the dessert, after the coffee, the one that has to wait for help. And Ziba comes, brings his crutches, and with his crippled feet, he leaves to his quarters. Nobody dares think that he's not a prince. Not even those wounds make him someone less important. It's not a disability that determines his identity. But he knows that he's there due to grace. I assume that there are princes that would look good without the cloth. But I'm like Mephibosheth. I look good behind the, clo the, behind the cloth. There's no suits, no makeup, no lights that can make me look like a son of the king. If it's not his grace and his, and his forgiveness, I'm a broken man like the majority of you. A man with crippled parts and pieces with terrifying scars, but for some reason, something surrounds me here and during the week. And so then, what was ugly transformed into something beautiful, something attractive. It's not a natural gift. It's not being born as a star. 
or having high self-esteem. No, that's just knowing that grace does what crutches can never do. Grace gives us a seat at the table and tells us, the same way you've been forgiven and loved, that's how you have to forgive and love others. The invitation to sit at the table is for everyone. Everyone that wants to sit down. That grand applause is for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Bye, people. Until next time. Apareciste una noche de soledad, abandonado y perdido. Te reconocí. Tu voz diciendo menos temas. Yo estoy aquí. El Padre me envió por ti y me curaste las heridas. Me sanaste, mi Jesús. Todas mis cargas las dejaste allí en la cruz Algo tan grande no lo puedo comprender Oigo tu dulce voz diciéndome una y otra vez Oh, 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 oh. eres bienvenido, eres amado una y otra vez Oh, 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 oh. bienvenido a mí Abandonado y perdido te reconocí Tu voz diciéndome no temas, yo estoy aquí El Padre me envió por ti Y me curaste las heridas, me sanaste mi Jesús Todas mis cargas las dejaste allí en la cruz